the syndical of Smith of the general strike suddenly becomes a reality. Paris has again become the center for European revolt. Unrest begins in urban centers of culture, where a majority begin to desire a radical change in the university. A minority begin to agitate for a radical change in society. Against the war in Vietnam. Regular academic functions cease. Its revolutionary government, its student Soviet, founded on continuous discussion. 30,000 students from the Sorbonne. The police are called in, arrest some students, and occupy the Sorbonne for the first time in its history. From the university, the confrontation spreads outward to other areas of French society. Hundreds of thousands of workers join the students in an act of public defiance. Wildcat occupations of factories, businesses, even government offices spread throughout France. A modern industrial state grinds unbelievably to a halt. Without central coordination, there are 10 million workers on strike. Not a token one-day strike, but an open-ended paralysis. Demands for worker control and the 40-hour week for participation and higher wages appear side by side. France, a nation of strikes, a country paralyzed across its length and breadth. The old disinherited join the new, and for a brief moment, the 19th and 20th centuries seem to overlap. The two goals are finally fused by a common foe, the authoritarian Gaullist regime. May 9th, the militant left rallies in its traditional meeting hall, La Mutualité. Radical students from France are joined by representatives of Italy, Germany, Belgium, and Spain to solidify the movement and sustain its momentum. Speaker follows speaker denouncing capitalism, imperialism, bourgeois nationalism, and bourgeois culture with the traditional entree of Parisian revolutionary cuisine. No one knows quite what to do, but everyone has a suggestion. By mid-May, it is clear that the Gaullist regime can be successfully defied. The demonstration expresses contempt or indifference toward the Gaullist regime, contempt for its paternalism, contempt for its agents, indifference to its cherished icons, indifference even to the symbols of the nation created by the revolutionary and Napoleonic eras. The red flag of socialism, the black flag of anarchism, the clenched fist raised high, the hymn of the proletariat, the international. Defying a governmental ban on all demonstrations and bypassing communist leadership, over 35,000 workers and students gather. For the first time, the participants seem convinced that revolution is actually possible. Openly insurrectional slogans are shouted as France wonders if the government will simply disintegrate through its inability to restore normal living and working conditions. The police station in the Latin Quarter is burned the most widespread and violent confrontation of the month. Quickly, the situation reverted to a thing speak war. Fire police giving those water and getting none in return. Collapse of traditional authority is total. The police are withdrawn from the Latin Quarter and the students take charge, both of the university and of the surrounding streets. The demonstrators reject traditional political processes as a farce, chanting, voting is whoring, election is prostitution. The Chamber of Deputies is dubbed the Chamber of Salah. The dispute was gaining ground in the streets. Even before it had reached this stage, the government had set up urgent talks to control the conflict. It was too late. That night, the Latin Quarter of Paris became a battleground. The Prime Minister and leading government members desperately tried to stem the flood of dissent. But it was no use. The 
mob was incensed by the sight of riot police. Workers were already talking of victory. But still, General de Gaulle remained silent. May 29th. The demonstrators marching relaxed and expectant through the working class districts of Paris obviously faced victory. De Gaulle is rumored to have withdrawn to his country estate. In reality, he is in Baden-Baden to check on the loyalty of the French army and to lay contingency plans for the military occupation of Paris. The revolution collapsed. Traditional parties, frightened by the new left, accept the traditional electoral game. The union leadership reasserts its control. The government begins cleaning up the streets and the destruction to remove physical memories of the month-long confrontation. Point by point, the police reoccupy the sites seized by the students and workers. 